In this video, I'm going to be upgrading a Spiderball gearbox from plastic gears to metal gears, and also upgrading the piston to one with metal gears and the piston head, and even upgrading the spring. I would only upgrade to the metal gears if the plastic gears have stripped and they're not working anymore. It's possible to preemptively upgrade to metal gears even if your plastic gears are not worn out to give the blaster more longevity and then you won't have to worry about the gears stripping in the future. The components that you're going to need for this upgrade are a set of high quality metal gears. Here's an 18 to 1 ratio. This is a SHS brand gears but they're resold by Rocket. A pinion for the motor. This is a D-shaped pinion gear because the stock motor has a D-shaped shaft. You're going to need a new anti-reverse latch. Now this is not exactly the right one for this model and we'll see why later, but it can be modified to work. There are also other options you can buy that would work better than this anti-reverse latch. You're going to need some shims to adjust the spacing of the gears. You're going to need a new piston body with a metal gear rack. So the pickup gear is the first tooth. The second tooth has been removed because what happens is the sector gear could prematurely engage with the second tooth instead of the pickup gear. This is a SHS brand, high quality piston body. And you're gonna need a new piston head, especially since the spider ball piston head is non-standard in terms of the spacing of the O-ring, so you can't use standard O-rings. This piston head has some bearings on the back for the spring. It's okay to buy a piston head like this. It's recommended by a lot of people to instead have the bearings on the backside support of the spring because these bearings just add mass to the piston head, which is not really a good thing. This piston head is sold as a silent piston head because it has this rubber bumper on the front. However, I've read that people say that this is not really worth it, but um, whatever. You can also just cut that bump off if you don't want it, or we're probably going to have to cut that bump down a little bit to adjust the angle of engagement of the gears, which is often referred to as AOE. If you want to use a stock spring, you can use a stock spring. If you want to upgrade the spring for a little bit higher FPS, then this is an M90 spring, which is the first upgrade I'm going to try. I don't know that I'd push it much more than that with a plastic gearbox. Something interesting I want to point out is this, this gearbox came with the SRB400 sub, which is the blue model. This gearbox came with the orange model, which is the rifle with the stock. Now, I took this gearbox apart for my takedown video. And I made a comment in the video that there was a set screw missing from the bottom of this motor cage to adjust the position of the motor and the engagement into the bevel gear. What I noticed is on the orange one that I took apart, the rifle model, is that that set screw is there. So I don't know why the set screw is missing on the blue sub model and the set screw is there on the orange model. What that tells me is that you're probably much more likely to strip the gears if you don't have it on yours because then you cannot adjust the engagement of the pinion gear with the bevel gear like you can when the set screw is there. So I'm going to be adding a set screw to this SRB400 sub blue version that came without it. All right, the first thing we're going to do is disassemble this whole gearbox. If you want to see a full video of that, then click up here in the top right corner for the full video of the gearbox's assembly. I'm not going to cover that in this video. One of the easiest components to replace is going to be this pinion gear on the motor. So we take a large flathead screwdriver and pop off the old pinion gear by going underneath it like that. It's going to pop off pretty fast, so just put your finger over it to keep it from springing away. And we're going to take our new pinion gear, the metal one. Be careful, it's got a little tiny set screw that comes with it. Don't lose that. The set screw is not yet engaged with the bevel gear. It's not going to hurt to put a tiny little bit of blue thread locker on this set screw. Because we don't want it vibrating loose. Make sure the pinning gear is seated all the way so it's flush with the end of the motor shaft. And then tighten it up. So once you've removed the cover from the gearbox, then take note of where all these gears go and the shims of that. Keep everything together 
because we don't want to lose track of stuff for being able to put it back together. You can always watch this video again. Oops, there we go. There's a bearing fell on the bottom there with a shim. <clears throat> So all of these gears have a shim on both sides. This one too. The Secta gear also has a shim on both sides. This ratchet pawl is a little bit different from the ratchet pawl that I purchased. The ratchet pawl I purchased has this wider area on the shaft that's probably designed for a metal gearbox. So here, instead on this gearbox, they have a long post here that you could trim down flush to the housing to get it to work, but I think there's a reason that they did this because the plastic is not as strong. So what I was able to do is tap out the pin using a hammer. It was really easy. I just put this over a hole, tapped it out using a hammer, it came out no problem. And then I'm left with a metal ratchet pawl. I'm just going to replace this ratchet pawl in here with the metal one. It's the metal one is a tiny bit thinner, so I'm going to add some washers and spacers to kind of center it. This tappet plate is always looking bent. I and the other one I took apart too is bent. I suspect those tappet plates bend and then they break here and then they come off. So these tappet plates aren't very long in the tooth and um, probably going to have to be replaced soon. If you have it open, you can bend your tappet plate back a little bit by hand. This metal is pretty soft. Let's compare this piston to the piston that we purchased. The teeth on the piston body that we purchased have a little bit different engagement positions. You can see that this initial pickup tooth is the same height, but then the rest of the teeth start at a different point. So we're going to have to see how well this works. And we may have to do a little bit of modifications to the sector gear if the sector gear is not releasing properly at the end because we don't want to jam the gearbox. The sector gear should pick up fine, but it may have trouble releasing based on where these teeth are positioned. This new piston head has the bearings on the back and you unscrew the screw on the back here to mount it. This is another screw that a little bit of Loctite would be good on. So here's the thrust bearing. So you can see how this thrust bearing doesn't come all the way to the top. There's a little gap. So the purpose of this thrust bearing it's to allow the spring to kind of rotate as it compresses because as, as it compresses and decompresses, the spring kind of wants to wind up and, and rotate. So this allows it to rotate freely and you get better performance from the spring. However, it seems that most airsofters recommend to have these bearings on the spring support, which is on the back of the spring. So this one that came with the splatter ball, it has this little washer here that's acting as a bearing. It's up to you whether you leave this bearing in or take it out. If you take it out, it's going to lighten up the head a little bit, but I think that's only really useful for very high rate of fire setups. I'm going to put a little bit of Loctite in this thread. Put this on the end of the piston body. It's probably a good idea to add some of this grease to the bearing. Now we're going to have to support this bearing on a screwdriver, like a number two screwdriver, like that. Screws out the end and put the piston head on and screw that in. Okay, so now if we compare these two piston head bodies together, what you'll notice is that the new one is much longer than the old one. So we're gonna have to do some modifications to the angle of engagement and everything to get this new one to work. Ideally, what we maybe want is, a, is one with a shorter head on it. Now I can't reuse the original piston head because it uses a non-standard O-ring spacing. The O-ring spacing of this is about 2.44 and that means it uses a small O-ring. The standard spacing for Airsoft and other gel blasters is 3 millimeters, which allows you to use a standard large O-ring here. So we can use like the green O-rings, which are supposedly really good for sealing. Okay, I can't really do anything on the piston head side to shorten the stroke. So you can see here where there's a, there's a gap because of this bump. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to trim off the bump on the piston head to shorten the stroke and improve the angle of engagement. I'm going to use a sharp knife to trim off 
the end of this piston Oh, I hit the metal in there. It's a metal rod on the inside. Turn off a little bit more. So I think that what we discovered overall is that this piston head is not ideal to, for this conversion, but it will work if lightly modified. So it turns out that there's a problem with this spider ball gearbox. And when I looked on the Gel Blaster forums in Australia, people reported the same problem with the G36C gearbox and trying to add metal gears to it and adding a plunger. This is the, the piston plunger with a metal rack. Is that the standard piston plungers are too loose in here. You can see how loose it is, moves around. And what happens is it comes off of the track, then your gear disengage and it jams up. Here, you can see it, like right there. Came off the track. I don't know if you can notice the amount of space there is in there, but it's really loose. It can come off the track from the pressure from the, from the sector gear, and then it jams up and it just won't work anymore. Unfortunately, there aren't any other known plungers that work with this gearbox assembly. So the solution that one person pointed out is to add a piece of plastic on top of the plunger to keep it from getting pushed off of the track. So basically it would be riding on the plastic on top and it wouldn't get pushed off of the track and it wouldn't lose its alignment and it would continue to mesh with the gears. I have this random piece of cylindrical plastic that looks like nylon, UHMW, something that's pretty slippery, pretty strong. It's a little bit under one millimeter thick, which is gonna be perfect for sliding into here. So I'm gonna cut this to size and get it to fit on here. Here you can see the dimensional difference between these two plungers. So this is a stock plunger, 20.15 between the track and then over the track is 22.37. And this one is 18.78 between the track and over the track is 21.6. So here 22.3. There's a good bit of difference, at least enough that it won't stay on the track.
Okay, so this piece of tubing of one millimeter wall thickness by somewhere, somewhere between 18 to 19 millimeters of ID, cut the shape to fit the top of the piston plunger so that it won't move around, is a perfect fit into the gearbox. It does two things. It helps keep the plunger centered on the track and it helps keep it from getting pushed up off of the track too. So I'm gonna clean up this surface and this surface of my alcohol and then I'm gonna glue that down with some super glue so it stays on there, it doesn't come off. I wrapped a rubber band around the piece of plastic and the plunger while the glue was curing to keep everything tight. So now this one millimeter thick piece of plastic is glued onto the plunger. I'm going to go ahead and replace this stock o-ring that came with it with a better quality o-ring. The main difference I can see with the stock o-ring is that the, the seam has a lot of flash where the mold came together that the other higher quality o-rings do not. So this black one here is a Viton o-ring and this green one is a fluorelastomer generic green o-ring. This is what gel ball players refer to as the green o-rings. So this has a lot better seam along the edge. It's much less noticeable. And this Viton o-ring it has practically no seam at the edge. It's barely visible. So the Viton O-ring has by far the best molding quality. This green O-ring is pretty good, probably good enough. The green O-ring seems a little bit more flexible than the Viton, but they're probably very similar in properties. I'm just gonna go ahead and try the green O-ring. As I reassemble the piston into the cylinder, I'm gonna add some lubrication to this. Put some lubrication inside the cylinder. No, oh, that was a lot. Spread that out. Spread that in this track too. Okay, when you go to put this O-ring back in, you're gonna have to kind of angle it like this and then squeeze the O-ring and make sure you don't pinch it anywhere. Test to see how much compression you're getting. Compression seems to be very good. You can wipe the excess grease off of the outside of the cylinder. Something to take note is that the cam feature on the plastic, stock plastic gear is different from the cam feature on the metal gear. The metal gear just has a pin. This one has a wider feature here. And so we want to simulate this feature. And we can do it using something called a sector delay chip. So you can buy sector delay chips. In this case, I modeled one that simulates this plastic gears sector cam. So I've got a few here and I probably need to trim them a little bit to, to clean them up. Here's the finished sector delay chip. I had to drill out the hole a little bit, sand the top, sand the surface to get it to fit, but now it seems to fit well. Is this engagement normal here? It seems to want to push up against that third tooth instead of engaging with it and then and pull away from the pickup tooth. Now there's a gap where the pickup tooth doesn't seem right. This is an SHS 14 tooth piston plunger and these are SHS gears resold as rocket so something is weird is going on here here's an SHS 15 tooth piston plunger and it seems to mesh a lot better like when I start from the pickup gear then it seems to mesh correctly but the teeth don't go in as deep into each other. But here it doesn't pull away from the pickup tooth like the other one does. This is the mesh of the stock piston plunger. Here's the pickup tooth and everything seems to mesh really well. There's not that weird gap. If I position the SHS 14 tooth plunger and the SHS 15 tooth 
plunger side by side and line up the gears, you'll notice that the pickup tooth is a different position on the 14 tooth plunger versus the 15 tooth plunger. See how the pickup gears don't align? Since I discovered that the teeth don't mesh properly between the sector gear and the rack on the piston, I'm going to have to change over to this other one where they do mesh properly. So I had to glue on another piece of plastic on this one. This was the SHS 15 tooth piston. The 14 tooth piston doesn't seem to work correctly. Now because the 15 tooth piston on the left has a little bit of in different engagement position of the first tooth, I'm going back to this plunger head that has the rubber bumper on here and I'm going to see how that works and readjust again because when I tried with this one that I had cut off, it was actually too short and it wasn't engaging properly at the right position. So now what I'm seeing here with the rubber tipped plunger head is that the angle of engagement is good but this tooth sticks out so far that it's rubbing against the gear here. I don't know how they make this stuff or what they expect you to do, like you have to shim down everything or something. I'm going to grind this tooth down a little bit. It meshes properly. I'm also going to have to remove the last tooth on the sector gear because here it doesn't release. So it's going to have to release from the tooth before the last one. So we're going to grind that, that down also at the same time. Here you can see the difference in the, the pickup tooth height on this 14 tooth one, which cleared, but like I said, the, the teeth engagement positions weren't correct. So the pickup tooth is not that high. It's just a little bit higher than the other teeth. On this 15 tooth one, the pickup tooth is way higher. Here you can see how much higher it is than the other teeth. So it's rubbing against the gear. I'm going to grind that down some. So I had to grind this pickup tooth down until it was almost level with the rest of the teeth because otherwise it was rubbing against the flat surface on the sector gear. Now it's no longer rubbing. And I also ground the last tooth out the sector gear to short stroke the piston, but in order to allow the piston to release, because before it wasn't releasing, that last tooth was pushing it against the back and it wasn't even able to release. I used a belt sander to carefully grind this tooth off. You could also use like a Dremel tool. Okay, I think we're ready to start reassembling this after all that work. So make sure you put a lot of lube on here and in here. Put some lube on this gear rack teeth. I'm going to put this middle spur gear in first. And one thing I need to do is I need to measure what is the spacing here because I need to see if I need to add any sh add some shims or how many shims I need to add. The 12.76, the spacing of the plastic gear, including the shims, 13.5. Okay, so I need to get the spacing to 13.5. So I'm going to use these original shims here. Put those on the metal gear. This is including the original shims, 13.5. So it should be good with the original shims. Put a little bit of grease on both sides here. And put this gear down in here. Moving on to the sector gear. The original gear with the shims measured 13.67. I'm going to take these shims off, put them on here. It's 
So I need to shim this a little bit. Point 0.2. So I'm going to put a point 0.2 on there. Put another point 0.2 on the other side. 13.58, which is pretty close. Pretty close enough. So let's put a little bit of grease on here. And let's put a little grease in these teeth. Now we have to attach the bevel gear. The bevel gear has the bearings. Put the bearing in the housing here. Bearing on both sides. This other bearing in the housing. And it's got some shims, so we're going to take a measurement of it with the shims on. Okay, so with the shims, we got like 14.15 millimeters. Let's grab this metal bevel gear. I'm going to put the shims on that. What's up? So, okay, so the metal gear with the stock shims, we got 13.26. So we're going to have to put a lot of shims on here to get to 14.1. So we need to add 0.8 millimeters, which is 4.2 shims. All right, so I'm going to add. 0.2 shims on both sides, and we're now at 14.09. A little bit of grease on here, without losing the shims, they all came off on the grease. Got to put the trigger back on. The trigger is these two pieces that can come apart. We're going to get the spring in between these two pieces. I gotta work that trigger in there. Might be overdoing it on the grease a little bit, but better too much than too little, maybe. I'll put the nozzle back on, put some grease in the in there to get this tap it back in here. Spring goes on this way. Tap it over the nozzle. Get the spring on the post here. And get that tap it back in here. It would actually be a good idea to put a little bit of grease on either side of this tappet. Put the tappet over the nozzle. Put the spring on. Put it over the post. Put it all back down in there. Make sure that the tappet sits behind the sector gear right now. Put that sector chip up here. It doesn't get in the way of putting it back together. It doesn't apply too much pressure. Now I believe the last thing we're missing is this the anti-reverse latch. So use this metal ratchet pawl. Put it over the original post. Like this. And put in the hole here. Put the bevel gear down. Then we're going to take the spring from the ratchet pawl. Anti-reverse latch and push the spring down there. There we go. So now that anti-reverse latch should prevent anything from reversing. Okay, so I think we're good to put the cover back on. That was a lot of work. I'm gonna put plenty of grease in here on this cover. Top of this cover, this, the, the modified piston's gonna be sliding in here. So I want it to be nice and lubricated. You have to use a screwdriver to get all these gears to line up. Line up the trigger. There we go. If the piston is off the track, go look in here, make sure it's on the track. Like it's not on the track there. So get it on the track. There we go. Piston is on the track. The top comes together. The bottom comes together. All the gear axles are in the bushings or bearings. And the trigger is in position. Now before we go and put 
completely put this gearbox back together. One of the things we want to check is how well is this pinion gear engaging with the bevel gear here. We might need to adjust the shimming. So if we attach the motor cage all the way in, and then we see like how far does this motor go in, the motor is going in pretty much as far as it can. It's up against the plastic up here, so there's really no room left for adjustments. That means that we need to shim this bevel gear towards pinion gear a little bit. So I'm going to take the gearbox back apart, unfortunately, adjust this shimming a little bit here. So last time we put shims evenly on both sides. This time I'm going to add the shims back to the other side to push it against the pinion gear. Okay, so the gearbox is back together. We can try to see how the motor engages again. Now we see that I end up meeting some resistance before the motor gets all the way in there. So that means that it is encountering the bevel gear before it's getting pushed all the way in. So that's better. So in doing that shimming of the bevel gear, it looks like I also need to move this gear down a little bit so it's not touching so it looks like I need to change the shim on the spur gear a little bit too. Right now it's like a 0.4 uh, shim and I need to lower the spur gear a little bit but I still want some clearance from the plastic so I'm going to find a 0.2 shim. So I'm going to replace that 0.4 with 1.2 shim on the bottom to, for clearance from the housing and then 1.2 on the top so it allows a little bit more clearance from the bevel gear. So there's still some clearance from the plastic housing now. And let's see if the clearance from the bevel gear has improved. Because before it was pushing down on it. Let's see how freely this spins. It seems to be pretty good. I don't hear any rubbing or friction. Okay, so that motor spur gear engagement feels better now. So I'm ready to put everything back together. When you go to hook these wires back up, you can see one terminal is red, the other one is not marked, so it's black. Got the red one here. Okay, so this motor still has a lot of motion in here that can be adjusted, compensated for. So right now I'm just going to move it up a little bit, use a hex wrench in the back here. I'm using a Torx wrench in this case, but it's a good substitute sometimes if that's what you have at hand. So I'm going to move this motor up a little bit and ultimately we're going to do a sound test when it's back in the blaster and you can kind of hear when it sounds the best, like when it's not forcing or whining, that's the point where you want to leave the motor. So right now I'm just going to put it until there's not too much play. I just don't want it to strip the gears, you know, right away. And for testing I'm just going to put the stock spring back in. I'm not going to put a higher spring yet until we know that it works well. Now if we make sure that these uh, mag contacts are protected and they're not going to touch each other or some other metal on here, we can do a quick test to see how it works. I'm going to turn it on of course. Well, it's working. Definitely a different sound from before. Put on full auto. So you can hear the motor sound changes as you adjust the screw. I can hear a sound like it, it slows down when I pull the motor away and speeds up when I push it in, so I suspect it's better when it's pushed in further. Okay, I'm going to take this M90 spring now and put it inside there and see what it does with the M90 spring. I want it to be in a release position. So the stock spring has a wire diameter of 1.15. The 90 spring has a wire diameter of 
and it also has a different coil pattern and it's also much longer. So it's going to have much more compression than this stock spring, a lot more. Oh boy, that M90 spring is strong in comparison. It's huge, huge difference. What I don't like is that the M, that this spring retainer can't keep it centered, it looks like. It can't, it's not keeping it centered up here. See how it's going off center right there? It's no good that it's going off center like that. It's working though. It's shooting with it. Oops, there it stopped. I don't know what's... One thing I noticed when I was doing some testing is that I have two different batteries here. I have this battery from the SRB1200 and the battery from the SRB400. I don't know if the new SRB400 batteries are different, but the SRB1200 battery has something extra in here. And what I notice is with a stronger spring, the motor would cut out whenever I would pull the trigger. Uh, I think especially if the battery was low. Now I charge a battery and it's not doing it right now. But I think that this is a current limiter or a resettable fuse or something that's limiting the current that the motor can draw such that it cuts out. Or maybe it's cutting out because there's a low voltage of the battery and it's cutting it out. And then as soon as, I, as soon as you release it, the voltage jumps back up again and it, it cuts back on again. This is probably a safety feature that Spiderball has added to prevent people from uh, damaging their batteries by drawing too much current. So I still have the M90 spring in here and I noticed that in order to keep the spring straight and keep it from like moving around like this, you need to put this orange piece on the back here. And not only that, but it also needs to be in the body. So let's put all this stuff back in here, put the contacts back in. So now when we put it back into the body with the orange piece in the back, the orange piece keeps that spring guide straight and keeps the spring from moving around. So it might actually work with this M90 spring in fact, when it's all in the body together. So I'm gonna put this back together and test it with the M90 spring and the new metal gears. I'm going to test it with the original Spiderball SRB 400 battery. Wow, that is loud. Much louder than it was before. This test uses the stock gel balls that come with the Spiderball SRB 400. I'm going to do single fire mode first. It looks like it's basically shooting two at once every time in single fire. Now I'm going to do full auto with the stock gel balls. In general, the accuracy with the stock gels is not that great. I don't know if you can see this. But... spread is kind of all over the place. The distance is definitely greater than with the stock setup at 260, 70 FPS, it's going a lot further. This blaster could really benefit from having a hop up at the end to improve the accuracy and also the distance. So this test is with the hardened gel balls. These are war interest 3.0 red gel balls. And I'm gonna do a quick FPS test in single fire mode. So for sure these hardened gel balls are shooting harder than the stock gel balls. It looks like in the 276 to 300 range for a lot of these shots, some are a little bit lower, 231, 254, but a lot of them are pretty high. Okay, so now we're gonna do the FPS test in full auto 
with the hardened gel balls of Warrantress 3.0. So in full auto with the hardened gel balls, it looks like we're averaging about 280 FPS. Some are a little bit higher, some a little bit lower, but it's got pretty good speed. Usually the hardened gel balls have better accuracy and higher FPS, but it seems like with the higher FPS from the M90 spring, the accuracy is not as good as the stock gel balls. They kind of fly off all over the place. Unfortunately, the accuracy is pretty bad. Honestly, I'll probably drop it back down to the original stock spring that it came with because at least the accuracy is better. With this M90 spring, the accuracy is all over the place even though it's shooting a lot faster and further. Soon I'm gonna try some hop-ups on the end to see how that improves accuracy with the M90 spring and I'll let you know how that works. I'm hoping that with the hop-up, that the accuracy is improved, I can continue to use this M90 spring for better distance.